Okay, thank you. All right. Cool. So uh, here I would like to talk about actual use cases and scenario of HTML5 for mobile, the mobile phones. Okay, again, yeah, my name is Tomomi, Tomomi Mura, and uh, I'm also known as Girly Mac on Twitter. Actually, I've been using this handle for a long time, like maybe 16, 17 years online. So I'm a front-end engineer you know, with a mobile focus and uh, currently working at Nokia as an HTML5 evangelist, also as an you know, open web platform advocate. And um, I've been working there about a year, actually less than a year, and uh, before joining Nokia, I was actually a developer at Palm for a WebOS platform, if you remember. <laughs> and uh, previously I was in uh, Yahoo, Yahoo Mobile, and I was in charge of uh, m.yahoo.com. And uh, yeah, I love cats. I'm a big cat person. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I love cats so much and I turned them into a HTTP status. You've probably seen it it's because it went viral. Like, it was crazy. Like, as soon as I posted online, actually tweeted, it went viral. And my name was like all over, even including CNN. Someone's like, oh wow. I mean, in the web page. It was kind of cool. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's talk about mobile. So in the mobile phones, I mean smartphones, it's been really like evolved since. And um, well, obviously I don't even have to talk too much about it. Like the long time ago there was some, yeah, the, uh, engaged in the gaming phone, people call it taco phones. And it was like one of the smartest smartphones, I would say, maybe some people don't agree with, but. But it was a really awesome phone back in the time. But it was, you know, tiny uh, processor, I mean, memory, and the screen was so small. And then nowadays, you know, we have really nice phones, fast, you know, Snapdragon processor, big memory, and display is so like nice and crisp, clear, and it has high pixel densities and such. And um, iDevices, yeah, even the phones, you know, as good as, or I would say it's better than the compu desktop computers used to be. So when we're talking about mobile, actually I'm using a picture of a jellyfish here. Because, uh, you know, the jellyfish has a funny life cycle. It has a mobile state and sessile state. Yeah. So the sessile, yeah, it's, uh, it's not really a technical term or anything. It's more like a zoological, you know, like a biological term that I'm familiar with because I have a background in biology. And I used to, you know, work with microscope all the time at the lab, but for whatever reasons, now, you know, I'm dealing with mobile phones, I'm writing JavaScript all the time, so <laughs> I don't know what happens in your life, you know. So, um, so and compared to when you're stuck at a computer at home or work, you know, that and compared with that, you know, the mobile experience can be really they're different from the desktop experience, obviously. And uh, some high level user scenarios on a mobile can be texting, yeah, the communicating. So that includes, of course, making phone calls. Maybe I am, could be tweeting, and uh, reading maybe news while you're waiting on a train, or maybe you're on a train. You're probably reading something to kill your time. And uh, you have larger like tablet devices, you probably read a magazine, or maybe you have Kindle reading books. Um, playing games. Yeah, that's one of the you know, most popular activity on mobile phones. And taking photos. Maybe you're taking photos of yourself. Or you snap, you know, taking snapshot wherever you go, maybe applying some fancy filters and tweeting away. And locating, that's another interesting thing you do on a mobile, like locate yourself, maybe search point of interest nearby, and of course you might be looking at directions, and maybe finding the nearest train station, or maybe you're like checking in at the restaurant and the four squares and such. Or it could be paying something, like maybe paying for a cup of coffee, or actually riding a subway train if you have like NFC enabled phone, and that probably not in this country, but this picture is actually in Tokyo, Metro. And a more thing, of course, listening to music, browsing the web, taking notes, 
That can be interesting. You, know, you can take note by, you know, by typing, or could be the voice. Maybe you know, using camera input to do that. Or like chat, video calls like Skype, and maybe you are using some AR, you know, the augmented reality, it's like scanning OCR, or could be like, you know, uh, real-time translating. It's a lot of interesting things you can do. So, can we create those like services or like apps with using web technologies like HMO5? So yeah, we already have stuff like you know um, your schemes. It's really like old school. You know, we have it from like a long time ago when we're talking about like WAP. Like XHML MP by OMN, such stuff. It still rocks, you know. And just like mail too, you can just use tail, SMS, and just, you know, creating um, tappable. Yeah, creating some tappable you know, phone numbers and such, it's really useful. And locating, yeah, geolocation has been around for a while and uh, it has a really good support. And on your mobile phones, yeah, uh, your phone can probably um, detect your location by using actual GPS, GPS satellites, or it could be GSM and CDMA cell tower, I mean cell IDs, or maybe using the Wi-Fi base stations, and can be, you know, like a GPS, like assisted GPS, it's software based. It can be any of those. And again, another, another thing you can do, or everybody's probably already doing it, is like supporting various screen sizes and devices using like CSS media queries. And yeah, this is something that could really create a huge buzz. Like in last year, like, you know, the coin, the term as um, the responsive web design. And that can be really useful if you are creating some content based you know, on the web pages and such, like publishing. So when you have some magazine apps, newspaper app, media query works probably nicely for you. And for layout and CSS Flexbox there, Grid is coming. And uh, yeah, that would create really nice you know, magazine-like layout and touch events for interactions. Could be offline storage. And for like 2D gaming, you can use Canvas Again, touch events and audio APIs. Or if you are not using Canvas, more like DOM scripting, I mean DOM-based um, gaming, so you can probably use any CSS animations and transforms. Could be multiplayer gaming with web sockets. And I said it's 2D gaming because um, 3D, you know, using like web GL might not be quite ready, or maybe it is already, but I just ex excluded from here. Okay. Hmm. So um, last year, around this time actually, about one year ago, uh, W3C announced an industry-wide initiative called the Core Mobile Web Platform Community Group, and Core Mobile CG for short, to help improve mobile web. So the, our goal of the Core Mobile, I mean goal of the Core Mobile, is to accelerate the adoption of the mobile web as a compelling platform for the development of modern mobile web applications. And um, in order to achieve this mission, the CG brings developers and uh, equipment manufacturers and browser vendors and uh, operators and other relevant members in the industry all together. And uh, the company include like Nokia, like the way I work, or Samsung, AT&T, Verizon, Vodafone, Orange, Telefonica, KDDI, NTT Docomo, the Japanese companies, and uh, like chip companies like Qualcomm, Intel, TI, and browser vendors like Mozilla, Opera, and Microsoft, and also like vendor neutral, you know, companies like Facebook and more. And we have a bunch of companies working all together. And uh, you know, we are like, competitors, we all industry competitors, but we really try to get together, you know, to um, agree on the core features that developers can depend on. And uh, yeah, try to compile some related conformance test suite and provide uh, H um, W3C 
about you know, use, use cases and scenarios and you know, other inputs that uh, drive successful mobile deployment. And uh, we have this uh, the final report here. It's actually called Mobile Web Platform 2012 from GitHub, actually. So I encourage you to just check that out. So, um, yeah, as a side project of this Cuomo community group, um, my colleague from Nokia, and John Neyland, and uh, Toby Langeau from Facebook, and he's actually a W3C fellow now, and I have initiated to develop some app, actual apps, to you know, showcase uh, use cases and such. So, it is an open source and camera application built using a web technology, it's called a Cuomo camera. And uh, I wish I could actually show the demo on my phone, but we don't have Elmo here, so I have a video. So basically this app, it's initiated by user, you know, tapping a button to, to take a photo. And then uh, after taking a photo, apply the filters, and, you know, saving lo save locally, or save, um, send it to the server, you know, share. So here's a video. So I'm actually trying, oh, uh, it's not nice. Okay, hope it works. So it's actually my office, Nokia office in Sunnyvale. And I'm on the balcony taking a picture of my next door neighbor. The legal department, by the way. I'm typing and taking video all together, so it's kind of cumbersome there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying which company it is. So that carousel, some the photo galleries. And I send it to the server. So yeah, this app is actually um, yeah made with HTML5 and uh, using JavaScript, like vanilla JavaScript. So um, yeah, we have set three main goals for this project. So we try to showcase the capability of web platform and the subset of features that Cuomo was driving. And uh, also educate, yeah, we try to educate the web developers about the how to best use those technology to build, you know, the modern web applications. And also we try to help improve browsers. You know, well, of course, we, well, we don't really work on the browsers, but the basically what we try to do here is uh, providing vendors with this app. And you know, basically showing what's working, what's not working, what's not working correctly in all test cases and performance and such. So um, now I'm gonna talk more in detail about actual the shiny new HTML5 features I've used for this app. So taking photos. So this app is again initiated by user interaction, taking picture. So um, Taking picture is done by delegating a native camera using something called HTML media capture. And a native camera returns a picture as a file object here. And it's pretty easy to implement. This is really, you can see here, so basically it's input, you know. You don't see any input, like a file input in this UI because I'm hiding, because you know, you just try to make it look nicer. I didn't want to have form input there, so I'm just hiding with CSS, but basically it's nothing more than a file input, you know, file upload input here. And um, uh, this element has that uh, type, type attribute as file. And then, then you specify the accept attribute here, and in this case, pictures, so, I mean the photos, so it's an image slash star. 
And um, this value can be video or audio. And um, here the capture attribute, well, it's actually a Boolean in the new specification. It just came out recently. Uh, but by the time I was working on this app, actually, you know, it wasn't supported by any browsers. It's too new, so I've used this, you know, capture attribute with value of camera, and that's how I used. Um, oh yeah, I have to mention that this is not the WebRTC or the get user media you might have heard of, you know, the taking photos and such. This is not, and it's far more easier to use for mobile phones. And uh, the browser support here. Oh, I have to actually mention when I'm showing this browser support, I mean the browser compatibility table here with the version numbers, I'm talking about mobile here. So in the Safari, it means the iOS Safari. And uh, the old uh, Chrome, you know, the uh, oldest version starts from 18. The reason is because that's the oldest one. And I believe it's still the current Chrome on Android phone. And the Chrome has a Chrome and a Chrome beta, and the current Chrome beta is 25, so I might talk about it later too. And I'm not including any of pseudo browsers, you know, like a Chrome for iOS and such. They are not real, I mean, uh, let's say the Chrome and iOS, it's not really Chrome, it's, it's actually Safari, so I'm not mentioning it about, at all. And uh, here you don't see Opera um, icon because it's not supported, but when I'm talking about Opera, it means Opera Mobile, and I'm excluding Opera Mini because it's a proxy browser. I'm not talking about proxy browsers yet at all. So the browser support here, Android does a pretty good job. I would say Google does an awesome job here. Chrome and Android browsers support perfectly, I would say. I say perfectly, but not um, the slightly older implementation, but if, I believe it's soon to catch up. And uh, they work as I expect, and it's really implemented correctly. And the works on Safari, iOS Safari 6, Firefox, and Blackberry browsers, they, yeah, it works, but, well, they have to implement correctly. They're doing it wrong. <laughs> so basically, when, what happened is, uh, when you tap the button, it gives you a prompt, you know, so you have to pick images from gallery or somewhere. It doesn't just, you know, initiate the camera, and a native camera, which we're well, supposed to in this specification. So please do, if you're working for those companies. And the file APIs. So the, the image you just you know, captured, it can also be displayed on the client side without uploading. So, um, mm, so when a user snap a photo, the API returns a file object list, and uh, you can access access the file object on change event. I use uh, um, the event listener here. And uh, reading a file um, uh, 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 here, a file reader object as an instance, then you can call this read as data URL method to display the image data in the data URL. So yeah, that once the object on load, you know, you can just insert it here. Well, let's say this is an image object here. You can just get an e dot target result that actually returns up, um, you know, basic. I mean, that URL of the image. I mean, the photo you have just taken. So, and once you get a photo, well, let's apply the filters, right? So, I use a canvas. So, this is an example of how you paint pixels that are in a canvas. So, first you define canvas and importing the photo into the canvas by using a draw image method here. And, um, yeah, then using the get image data method to obtain an image data object containing the copy of the pixel data of the context. And uh, then some pixel manipulation, applying a filter well, I'll talk about it in the next slide, but then uh, finally, you know, once it's filters, and uh, finally you use the put image data method, you know, just paint the pixel data back into the context. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, Canvas is supported pretty nicely on m most of browsers for mobile. 
So yeah, here's a, a little bit of explanation of how I apply filters by you know manipulating all those canvas pixels. So there's a data property. Data property of the image data stores and color information of each pixel in the canvas. So this diagram I created, it's three by three, it's only like nine pixels, well, tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny image. Well, it's not really, okay. Um, and each, okay, um, each canvas pixel, oh, so I say it's a nine pixel total, but actually has a, um, the array, the array of 30, uh, length of 36 here. And the reason is that each pixel, each canvas pixel in the data array consists of a four bytes values here. It's a red, green, blue, and alpha channel. And uh, each of the RGB and A values can take values between zero and 255. Okay, keep in mind. So this is actual code I'm using. So this is an example of giving a grayscale filter. Grayscale filters um, in an image in a canvas. So here's, yeah, let's talk about image data and data property here. I just you know, assign as D. And uh, see here. So, yeah, I'm looping this whole thing by skipping a four here, right? Because of that, you know, I just explained why. Um, I just tried to grab, you know, one, oops, <laughs> one canvas pixel at the time. And then you can grab that, you know, RGB by just, yeah, getting your first index and plus one and two. And I, I'm not using alpha channel in this case. So I don't have to worry about it. But if you want to, you know, A could, of course, it would be the D in the index of I plus three here. And there's some magic equation here. Well, what it is, is that it's actually something called like CIE 9031 luminance. And uh, what it does is converting the pixel into gray scale, which it looks nice in your human eyes. So um, you've noticed that the whole thing, you know, whole calculation has to be done at each like full loop iteration here. So, you know, let's say you have an image, 100 pixel by 100 pixel, that means, you know, this operation has to go through like 10,000 times. And in my app, of course, when you're taking a photo, uh, these days, like, camera phones has really fancy cameras of like megapixels, you know, like huge photos. There's no way I want to use those, you know, big image. So I actually have cropped it off and I'm making images uh, 612 by 612. But still, you know, even I shrunk it down image, it's still, you know, the pixel, like a total pixel will be like almost 375,000 pixels. Means, you know, this has to go through that many times, you know. It's slow, it's painfully slow on mobile. So here's a, some wish list, you know, to create a faster canvas. Hardware acceleration would be nice. And um, as long as I know, uh, IE 10 on a Windows Phone 8 does use uh, hardware acceleration. And I think I've heard of Chrome does too. I'm not sure about other browsers, but probably not Safari because it looks super slow. So yeah. You know, with the hardware acceleration, yeah, faster GPU will be awesome. And uh, on the software side, it's, well, 32-bit pixel manipulation would be nice. So the example I just showed to you was actually a traditional way, like 8-bit operation here. So the object return by data property and image data I was referring earlier was uh, actually a canvas pixel array. And um, apparent, I mean, this actually is deprecated in favor of UN8, it's unsigned, UN8 clumped array. And I always just typed array, you know, that you, you can use a bitwise left shift and then in the 30 bit operation, it's supposed to be faster. Um, as long as I know, a Firefox and Open Mobile has that switch. so. They've been using UNA clumped array. And the Chrome, current Chrome, you know, Chrome 18, it's still in the canvas pixel array. 
not sure about the Chrome beta. Probably Chrome beta, you know, which is uh, 25, might have made a switch. And Android 19 is still using old fashioned way. I mean, the would be the deprecated array. And uh, yeah, another nice thing to have is a background operation with using a worker. That's like, whoa, yeah, I wish. <laughs> it doesn't happen yet, hopefully soon, sometimes. And some goodies I can use in two blob method. So, um, so now I got a filter the folder. And it's nice to, you know, convert into the blob. Uh, that's, uh, I go on the binary large object, and uh, that's what it is. And now I'm using just easily using canvas to blob. And it's actually async call back here. And uh, you can just specify you know, what kind of type. And um, unfortunately, only Firefox on mobile, you know, Firefox supports it so far. So, you know, if I want to do this, like converting the blob for the other the browsers, I really have to write, like, another function. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> and uh, you convert canvas to that URL first, which is okay, but then invoke a blob constructor and uh, finally convert it into blob. So, I have to, you know, write a lengthy method to do that. And blob URL. That's not other nifty stuff you can use. It's an object URL represent a specified blob and blob object. You see this some funky little URL. That's the, the blob URL. And you can create that you know, new object URL by just uh, using a create object URL. Uh uh, here. And it's which lifetime is tied to the document in the window on which it was created. And you can release it with a uh, revoke object URL method if you no longer need it. And it actually has a pretty good support on browsers now. And uh, oh, oh yeah, I have to explain. Those the stars here, yeah, they rely on the WebKit and the vendor prefix, but that's it. They're still, yeah, Blackberry as well. They all need uh, the WebKit prefix. Index DB. I think you guys are here yesterday and learned a whole lot of things about Index DB. Yeah, well, this was actually giving a huge headache on mobile. It's like for, the, you know, for writing this app, I'm spending most of the time writing and testing, you know, the Index DB on various browsers and the phones. So it seems to be easy, yeah, it supports to. So this is how you open the database. Oh, by the way, it's async operation. It has um, the specification comes with synchronous too, but I don't think it's uh, working in any other browsers yet. So when we're talking about this, it's always async for now. And uh, the webkit needs a prefix, so you have to use window dot webkit index db. And uh, I haven't really tested it. I'm not sure, but it looks like uh, the Chrome beta, so current Chrome 25 doesn't require the prefix anymore. So the basic async IDB is supported by Chrome, Blackberry, and Firefox, and IE10. Well, it's kind of ironic because I'm calling this like IDB with a small i, but it's not supported by Safari, you know, iOS at all. <laughs> so yeah, again, why you know the writing the index DB was such a pain for me was uh, has really spotty support. So again, the Safari doesn't support it. Opera Mobile doesn't support it either. And uh, there's are so many like uh, mixture of whole like a deprecated specification, new specification, all kind of stuff, all mixed. I mean, there there are some um, multiple specification has been modified since. For example, like the Firefox, the Firefox have started uh, supporting IndexedDB uh, version four, I believe. But uh, and uh, they dropped the set version. It's it's old. It's all the old way to do, but now the set version is deprecated at the version 10. So now the new Firefox store is in on 
upgrading the defense fired or when you know the new index DB is open and such. And uh, the transaction mode has been switched from uh, the constant to um, string. Again, this green one's a new specification. At version 13, so uh, if you just write in the index DB for newer Firefox, oh, you can just use a you know current standard specification just fine. But if you want to support some old Firefox, you might want to care about you know include all the old specifications as well. And uh, Chrome is another annoying one. <laughs> so when I'm trying to support Chrome 18, well, the Chrome 18 is really still using the old deprecated specs. And I believe the Chrome beta switched to new, but I don't know how many people already have switched to Chrome beta, so I'm still trying to write everything, so it's a mess, and well, wow, gosh, it was really a mess. And also, I'm trying to save a blob, you know, the binary object into the index DB, but Chrome doesn't support it at all, even the Chrome beta. You know what, actually, it's really awful. So in the Chrome beta, Chrome 25 doesn't support blob, but uh, if I'm trying this, there's no way to really feature detect, so I have to just use a try and catch and throw an error and such. And it crashes Chrome with 18, so it was really difficult to deal with that. Uh, okay, so yeah, for the app, you know, the app I was writing, for the Chrome, well, the CNC doesn't support Bob at all, so I use uh, basics for, you know, that you are a string. So I'm basically just storing a whole, like a huge strings in IDB, and uh, I'm not sure about the performance and memory consumption and such. I don't think it's good at all. So, okay, so once you get the filtered um, photos, well, let's send it to server or share the photo. So I use XHR, XHR2 actually. So, um, XHR2 adds support for the new form data interface. And this form data object lets you compile a set of key value pairs to send using XML HTTP requests easily. And here I don't have actual form. Like I see whole data, but no form here. But the cool thing is, um, you know, I can just instantiate form data object and use um, append method to just append the field on the fly. It's pretty cool. And um, yeah, the Opera Mobile supports that too. So it has pretty good support. And uh, with XML, um, XHR2, the you can, you know, the data you can send is not limited to like DOM string or XML. You can send uh, binary data as well. It's pretty cool. And uh, here in my example is registering some events. And uh, yeah, XHR2 comes with some cool stuff like progress events. So here's the actual example I'm using. So basically, yeah, I'm just getting the progress in the percentage here in an integer. This is the same as a math floor. It's just faster to do that, do that way. And uh, just uh, displaying, you know, oops, <laughs> displaying the numbers here. But it's probably cool if you use a HTML5, you know, progress element to sh show the whole UI. It would be really cool. And of course, yeah, you guys learned so much more about calls and cross origin resource sharing today, this morning. That was an awesome uh, presentation by Brad. And uh, yep, so you can do the, uh, the cross origin resource sharing easily, really. So then you got an XHR request and you can send it to the other server and somewhere else. So, you know, that typically uh, web apps using XHR, you know, you can only make HTTP request to the domain it's loaded from and not to the other domains, of course. Uh, but you, you know, by using cores, you know, um, now that allows you web apps to domain, you know, application on one domain to make a cross domain Ajax request in another domain. So that's really simple and safe. So this is how you do, you know, this is like a domain that you want to grant access or use in star. Well, this is an example on Apache. So basically that's all I have to do, you know, all the lines you have to add in HD access file, easy. And uh, great browser support.
and touch event. So I had this a picture gallery in a carousel. You can swipe back and forth using touch events. So uh, this is actual example, the ex actual code I use. So it's an Apple's touch event. So those touch events has been a de facto standard to the, you know, as a touch event for years. But well, oh, by the way, if you're using those touch events, you might want to add the mouse pins as well. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't really work on the browser and the desktop. And uh, yeah, so it's been a de facto standard for years, but well, there's some drama in between the you know, Cupertino companies and the rest who you know, wanted to standardize these touch events and all those legal concerns and such. Uh, so, <laughs> so what happened was, Last year, the Microsoft had submitted the alternative way of the touch event standard proposed and it proposed the W3C. And I think Jacob was talking about it yesterday, so now I suppose you know a lot about. So yeah, basically, well, recapping, but it takes uh, any input, like not limited to just, you know, the um, finger touch. They include a mouse event as well, in a mouse and pens and could be more things later in future. So that's how, yeah, you can just um, feature test here and just use pointer down, pointer move, point up instead of like touch star moving in. And uh, currently, yeah, only i 10 supports you, so you need a MS uh, prefix. Yeah, and I'm hoping that more browsers gonna support soon. And apparently uh, Microsoft have submitted a patch to WebKit already. So it would be super cool if I, you know, I mean the Chrome would support it soon. And uh, well, I would really love to see that works on Safari. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, oops, I don't know how much time I have. So more APIs I use on the app, so I'm not gonna talk too much about detail, I don't have time. But I've used a history API, it's a pop statement. So the app is actually a single page app, but you know, this enabled back, back button, so you can just back and forth with an app. Actually, I don't think I made it forward, but you can go back to the previous state. And the screen orientation API for the, you know, using the orientation change event. And uh, yeah, CSS3 transforming animations. Web fonts, you probably didn't see the actual web fonts, but I use it for um, the icons with uh, the data a custom attribute to create it, you know, more semantic way. So you can use the data attributes in markup. And also I use a hidden attribute. That's cool stuff I like. So it basically does something like, you know, when you set in the CSS display known. So you can toggle, you know, hide and show by using a hidden attribute in a markup. Or just, yeah. Um, I forgot the browser support. I don't think all the browsers, modern browsers, support hidden attribute actually. So I still have to, you know, add it full back in the CSS, you know, a display known. I think it was IE 10. All right, so um, what if the shiny new HTML5 features I just showed you are not supported by mobile browsers? Yeah, yeah, you might want to think about like polyfills and such, but when, the, you know, I was talking about like media capture is not quite, oh, I actually forgot to mention. So media capture is indeed supported by IE10, but um, it's, yeah, it's, disabled for the mobile, I mean, it's disabled on a Windows phone, so it doesn't work, and it's even worse, I mean, even the feature detection doesn't work because the browser, it's being implemented, so browser think it's supported, but it's actually not, so it just do nothing. So there's something like this, you know, like a device APIs, the polyfills mm, might not be available, so, well, yeah, I use a phone gap, there's a phone gap for that. So it's an awesome tool you can use to fill in a gap in the missing features, especially like device APIs. So there's a phone gap by, yeah, not only by Adobe. Uh, it's open source, cross-platform, and mobile development framework that enables to create hybrid apps. So yeah, it's no longer web apps, it's a hybrid apps, but native app now. 
and this cool thing is that it plays an important role, you know, in enabling access to the web technology on more devices. So it's, you know, it's simple. You can just build a web app and wrap it in a phone gap and just deploy. So I did create a Windows Phone, I mean, a Windows Phone 8 app using the phone gap with really like minimum effort. So, yep, uh, this is, okay, so everything I was talking about is on GitHub. It's not quite done yet, to be honest, but well, you can just go look at how it's done. And, uh, yeah, my next goal is, yeah, clean and simplify the code and make it better. And I'm planning to write it, like, document, you know, I plan to document the whole thing, so maybe write a blog about it. Oh. It's a little bit of a company talk here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we have some program called Nokia Premium Developer Program, and this is ninety-nine dollars a year, and uh, that actually comes with a whole like cool stuff for Windows Phone development, including the, some fee that you have to pay in the Win I mean, the Microsoft side, the, the membership. It's cost itself costs ninety-nine dollars a year. So. I have a 25 coupon, so you can get that for free. So just ping me, and the first 25 person I'll email the code. So I'll show you my um, email address in the end. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, and that's all about it. And uh, yeah, again, just check out the code, see how it's been done in GitHub. It's on github.com slash como slash camera. All right, thank you very much. Questions? Nobody sleeping? <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Um, so that uh, GitHub URL, is that to the, just the source code or is there uh, a sample where you can actually go and test? Oh, you know what? Actually, haven't deployed it yet. I mean, I haven't created like a GH page. And uh, I do have it in the Dropbox, actually. It's funny, I use a Dropbox. I put my, uh, you know, the local GitHub repo on the Dropbox so I can, you know, test on, on devices so easily. But yeah, so yeah, and the GitHub is currently only a source code. Right. Yeah, but that's really, it doesn't, depends on any server side code. It's all, you know, front end. Yeah. So you, yeah, you can just test easily. Just put in some server just in a phone. But uh, yeah, I'm planning to put it somewhere nicer with actual domain names and such, but I haven't done it yet. Oh, plus, because we are demoing this app at the Mobile World Congress next week, so it should be ready by next week. Thank you. Hi, how's it going? I had a question about PhoneGap, actually. Mm -hmm. I hope you can answer it for me. Uh, the limitations of it. How much, how close can we get to a native functionality with that phone gap using the HTML5 and like, does it just, uh, when it gets processed, does it just, like if something doesn't support it or something like that, it just throws in the code? I mean, I've, I'm kind of new to it, very curious oh, though. Hmm, well, it really depends on what you're talking about, but in this case I use uh, phone gap's uh, camera API to be able to access a native camera. Okay. It's because, you know, again, like an i10 on the mobile doesn't, what, well, I can't say it doesn't support, it's more like disable the feature, you know, of the media uh, captures. But yeah, so for camera API, that's super easy to use actually. And I haven't really tried other APIs, but oh, you should be able to grab, you know, Adobe guys here and you should ask questions. Fair enough. But okay. I really like PhoneGap, yes. Do you think that it's actually sufficient for like large format applications or is native still the same way? Just curious. Hmm. Your opinion. You seem to have a couple. <laughs> Well, still, that's this you rely on. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm running out of time, but cool. no yeah. worries. Thank well. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tomomi. And um, we'll take a five-minute break and be back for the next talk at three.